Christianity versus Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto, and Buddhism. So we're going to look at the four religions of the Far East, what they call the Far East. Two of these come from China, one comes from Japan, and the other, Buddhism, began in India, but it spread eastward and then it went worldwide. Now here's, a, you might be saying, why, why is he doing all four of these together? Well, because they're all part of the Far Eastern religions, but also because they have a lot of things in common. All of these religions have the following things in common. One, all of them are a mix of beliefs with different cultures. Uh, you find teachings uh, in one religion and you, you find the same teaching in the other religion. And so they kind of borrowed from each other uh, to make up the religion that exists uh, today. Um, the idea of universality of truth exists in them. They say that uh, each person only has part of the truth. This is why the truth is, differ is different for each person. This is the concept behind these religions. Each person only has part of the, uh, the entire truth. And so that's why my truth is different than your truth is different than that person's truth, you know, according to uh, believers uh, who follow these uh, religions. Also, they practice ancestor worship. Um, the spirit of the past generation is kept alive as long as the present generation keeps their memory alive. This is how, um, uh, this is how they believe that they live on. Unlike in uh, Christianity, we believe that we live on consciously in a different body, in a different state, in the presence of God. But in many of these religions don't believe that. They believe that you only continue on in memory as long as the future generations keep your memory alive, you are still alive. Uh, they're animistic. Remember we talked about animism. In other words, there are good and evil spirits. Uh, the use of fireworks and kites, for example, in many of these places are used to keep the evil spirits away. So you see a lot of mid Middle Eastern countries they, they fly kites, you know, it's, it's a popular pastime. And we think, oh, how cute, they're all flying kites, you know, but that's directly connected to uh, their uh, religion. Uh, they're usually associated with state politics. In other words, in many of these religions, they're connected to the state politics. And also they are concerned with what is socially appropriate rather than what is sinful, uh, salvation or the end of the world. In other words, um, they're more interested in what is right between individuals in society now, rather than worry about the end of the world or the afterworld. These are things that they don't really concern themselves with very much. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, the first two Chinese ones first and uh, from China, the first is Taoism. And the other one is called Confucianism. And you know the routine, I just go through all the same headings for each of these religions. So the, the founder, Lao Tse, lived uh, from 604 to 517 BC. This is the founder of Taoism, known as the old master, the old master. He was a humanist and he believed and taught that man was the highest being. In other words, the highest level you can go to was man. There was nothing beyond that, not angels, not God. Man was the highest. To experience, quote, God, uh, man had to look within himself or look into nature if you wanted to know about a higher uh, status. He believed in the perfect unity and harmony of nature and he rejected social organizations of course, when he lived, there was the feudal system, you know, where peasants were ruled over uh, no, by nobility. Uh, he uh, believed that all types of uh, social organizations were useless. Uh, and so he withdrew to live uh, like a hermit. Um, from two to four, the origins, the deity and mankind. Those of you who have not been in this class before, uh, those are three of the headings that we've looked at for each of the religions. And I'm doing all three at the same time, the origins deity and the idea of mankind in Taoism. For example, this religion taught that there was a force, 
in nature called the Tao. And it was the force that animated nature. This force had two elements, which when balanced produced a good life. The force was represented by the Tao symbol of yin and yang. Yin was black, it was negative, it was earthly, it was feminine. Yang was either red or white, it was forceful, it was heavenly, it was positive. And the idea was to find a balance between these two forces. And when you did, then your life was good. Your life was out of balance, uh, excuse me. It, when you weren't doing well, when there was illness, when there was trouble, it meant that your life was out of, out of balance. You had to get the yin and the yang in balance. This idea was that the forces within the Tao flowed back and forth between the positive and the negative, creating what life was and man's lot was to observe this flow and using a popular term, go with the flow, roll with the punches. Don't, you know, in, in, in the Western culture, what do we do? We take things head on, right? Take the bull by the horns, you know, let's, let's get after it. That's how we think, you know. But in Taoism, you, you roll with the, you know, you take your time. In China, in ancient China, you know, you didn't see straight roads. You know, you want to go from point A to point B, there were 50 miles, you know, from point A to point B. And you know, if, if you're in America, you know, you get yourself a bulldozer and you bulldoze everything out of the way, and you, you know, we get straight highways here, right? If you go to China, oh no, no, no. You, you, you go, if there's a rock, you go around the rock, you know, or you go around the tree. If there's any object there, you don't disturb anything. You keep balance, okay? This was the idea. Uh, and this accounts, as I say, for the way that the Chinese observe the flow uh, or how the flow is going. And that's in politics, in war, in society. During the Vietnamese War, a lot of you don't remember that, but anyway, you might have studied it in school. During the Vietnamese War, North, the North Vietnam was aligned with China. Uh, excuse me, not aligned with, but China was trying to invade North uh, Vietnam. And uh, America came and tried to you know, push back, so to speak. And the thinking in China was, what do we care? We're, we're gonna wage this war now, and in 10 years from now, and in 50 years from now, and if it takes 100 years, if it takes an entire century for us to win and to overtake this country because they were interested in the fertile uh, land of the North, uh, North uh, Vietnamese, they didn't care. Here in the West, we wanted to get in, win and get out before the next you know, political cycle came around, before the next administration came in. So we've got to get this war over with, let's go. Chinese, you know, Taoists, they don't think like that. If we're at war, then we're at war. And we'll just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. And if it takes two centuries, we got, you know, we got plenty of time. And we have plenty of people. So this is, this is the thinking, okay? And much of this thinking still remains. You, if any of you are interested in politics and you read and you follow what's going on in China and you know, world politics, notice how the Chinese operate. You know, they avoid confrontation, you know, but they do what they do. Anyways, uh, their concept of salvation uh, in Taoism, the objective is not to know because absolute truth is not knowable. The objective is, of man is to be at one with the Tao. In other words, you got to get into that, get into that flow. That's your objective. That's what you're trying to do. At death, according to Taoism, at death, the soul merges with the spirits of the ancestors which are part of the yin and the yang as well. That's why in Taoism, uh, the uh, respect of the elders and also uh, worship of ancestors or remembrance of ancestors is very important. Their cultus, their scriptures, their geography and some miscellaneous thing, they developed temples and certain rites, they used magic along with the Tao philosophies. The Tao Te Ching, which is a treatise of Tao's and its power, was written in the fourth century by several writers. It's not a holy book. 
it's more, uh, not seen as revelation. In Christianity, we believe that God inspired this book. In Taoism, their holy writings, their important writings, they don't see that as coming from, quote, God. They're just writings, uh, philosophy, if you wish, the philosophy of, of uh, Taoism. Uh, let's see, um, yes, um, China is where it started, uh, Tibet, some in Japan, there are 40 million followers, uh, roughly. Taoists have no concept of morality. If you're a Taoist, there's no such thing as absolute right or absolute wrong. It's just, how does whatever happen fit in with the flow of things, all right? And they also reject all institutions as counterproductive. So that's a little bit about Taoism. You, you often see that little symbol, right? People sell that as jewelry. You wonder what that is. Well, that's the symbol of the Tao. All right, the next religion, Confucianism. Confucianism. The founder, Kung Fu Tse. You wonder, wow, where's that turn? Kung Fu, where does that come from? Kung Fu Tse lived 551 to 478 BC, before Christ. Uh, he was a civil employee of the Chinese government at the time who was promoted to provincial judge. And as provincial judge, he saw a social injustice that was destroying the state. And he wrote a treatise on the art of living as an attempt to correct the problems of his society. So he lived in a society where the feudal system was going down. You know what I'm saying? The nobles controlling all the peasants, all of that was starting to go down. And in its place, there was chaos, there was, there was, there was theft, there was you know, the breakdown of society. And so he writes this treatise on how we're supposed to live. His crystallization of, uh, uh, excuse me, amid his teachings at the noble ruling classes, he aimed it at the classes uh, above and he formed disciples to carry on his teachings. Uh, now, origins and his idea of deity. The religion, Confucianism, it's not really a religion as we see it, but it's classified with the world religions, is based on the teachings that he left behind and not his revelations or his charisma. Uh, this man never claimed that God spoke to him or he had a revelation from some uh, supreme being. He was not necessarily a charismatic uh, leader. His crystallization of past wisdom into a system of teaching influenced Chinese society for over 2000 years, actually up until Mao Zedong. When Mao, when Mao came, not you Mao, but the other Mao. When Mao Zedong came and the uh, uh, communist revolution came to China, that was the end, uh, basically, of Confucianism. A new thinking came in, and that was Marxism or communism came in at that time. But up until that time, Confucianism was the, the thought, if you wish, the main thought. Uh, deity, the idea of deity, there's no personal deity in Confucianism. The usual nature or spirit worship or ancestor worship as seen in other religions is what they had. And there's also no end of the world scenario. You know, in Confucianism, there's nothing that says at the end of the world, this is going to happen. No, the world's just going to keep right on going. Keeps going round and round and round. Uh, their concept of mankind, you know, the question, where does man come from? And what is man all about? And all that business. Man is part of the universe. Man is born good. The emphasis is not where man is going after death, but rather how man or mankind actually interacts now with the five major relationships in life. So it was the study of these relationships that was the essence of the teaching and the practice of Confucianism. His point was there, there's no God, there's no at the end of the world you go to heaven, there's none of that. It's how you live now. And how you live now is based on the type of relationship or the quality of relationships that you have with other people. Five main relationships. One, 
uh, one relationship, father and son. That's one relationship, father and son. And in Confucianism, the goal for the father was to aim for kindness. The goal of the son was respect. The second relationship, the elder brother and the younger brother. And the goal for the elder brother was to be noble. The goal for the younger brother, respect. Uh, the third relationship, husband and wife. The goal for the husband, kindness. The goal for the wife, obedience. The relationship between the elder and the younger. The goal of the elder, kindness. The goal of the younger, uh, of the younger deference, to defer, respect, a kind of respect. And then the relationship between ruler and subject. The goal of the ruler to be benevolent, the goal of the subject to be loyal. And so each of these main relationships here, I mean, I've, I've brought it down to almost its most simplest format here, but there's lots of writing and a lot of teaching about how to be a father and how to be a son and how that relationship ought to function. Okay, lots of writing on each of these uh, relationships. Uh, their ideas of uh, salvation and worship. No concept of heaven or hell for individuals. The ideal to which the religion pointed to was proper harmony in life between all men based on the proper maintenance of those relationships. If you maintain those relationships properly, there'll be balance in society and your life will be good. And you know, that's what the Confucianism was all about. There was no worship per se. The practice of Confucianism was the study and the practice of the actual teachings. Uh, also the per pursuit of the five cardinal virtues. Jen, which was, which was uh, the good of others. Uh, Xi, uh, which was righteousness by justice. In other words, you were a just person by the law. Li, uh, a, a moral way of acting. Uh, qi uh, was wisdom and sin uh, was faithfulness, faithfulness to your family, to your elders, faithfulness to your king. These were the five major virtues that you pursued. And the teaching was about each of these particular virtues and how to cultivate them in your personal life and how to apply them to those five relationships that I was talking about. So harmony with each other meant harmony with the past, harmony with the spiritual forces, the Tao, and ultimately harmony with heaven. In later times, his disciples raised him uh, to deity status and uh, temples and worship systems were uh, developed uh, throughout, uh, throughout China, but that was after many hundreds of years. Their scriptures, geography, miscellaneous stuff. His writings and those of his disciples are collected in the four books. The Analects, which are his sayings, the sayings of Confucius in the Analects. The Great Learning, How to Be a Gentleman. Uh, the key book was The Doctrine of the Mean. That was the philosophy of uh, Confucianism. And then the book of Mencius, which was a commentary on Confucian philosophy. So they, you know, we have the Bible. They had these four main books here as that, that uh, explained and developed uh, this way of life. Confucian himself, Confucius himself uh, compiled six books of writings called the classics. The Chinese uh, had a religion for 2000 years before Confucius but his system of teaching and personality gave form to that religion. And after he died, these two merged to form a single religion for China, which they called Confucianism. And it spread to Southeast Asia and to Korea as well. So there's a little bit about Confucianism. Next one is uh, Shinto, Shinto. Until World War II, this religion was woven into every part of Japanese life and thought. The politics and religion and history were a single unit, the Shinto religion, okay? 
Let's look at the founder and origins. There is no founder in this religion, no founder. It evolved from a basic nature worship. We talked, remember when we talked about unorganized religion, nature worship, people who worshiped uh, the trees and the stars, you know, nature worship. Well, Shinto started as a nature uh, religion, but with time, a mystic story developed where Japan became the center of creation destined to rule the world. And that concept was at the center of the religion of Japan up until World War II. They added concepts from Taoism, the idea of harmony, and from Confucianism, the idea of social order, as well as Buddhism. A lot of the Shinto philosophy comes from Buddhism. And they formed this religion, Shinto. The uh, idea of God, deity, and the idea of mankind, they believed in many gods. They were polytheistic. Uh, they believed that creation was a product of male and female gods. A very earthly idea of creation, but they believed male and female gods produced together uh, the earth, the creation. Uh, but the descendant of the gods was sent to rule Japan. And then his descendants became emperors. And so the leading families uh, and the Japanese people believed themselves, all of them, to be uh, lesser gods living on the island of Japan. The island of Japan was especially formed by God and then inhabited by God uh, and the leader was a God, okay? And this is what they believed. We're not talking about you know, before Christ. This is what they believed up until World War II, this idea. A very closed society. You, you, didn't, you didn't emigrate to Japan, you know? You didn't, you know you, no, they had a very, very small percentage of foreigners that lived in Japan. It was a very closed country up, up until that time. Um, it's idea of scripture, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, idea of salvation and their worship. Uh, the only idea of salvation came from Taoism and other religious concepts within Shinto. Uh, the essence of the Shinto religion was to maintain and promote Japanese supremacy. That was the whole idea of the religion. Ancestor worship was their main form of worship they had shrines and temples that had prayers and offerings to the past or to patriotic ideas or to certain ancestors. That's why they burn candles and things like that to ancestors. You see that, you ever wonder, you go to Catholic church. I, I grew up Catholic. I remember every church I went to when I was a kid, they had candles, you know, and the, and, and the candles had a statue and the statue represented a saint of the past or Mary or Jesus or something or Joseph and you lit the candle as a form of worship or honor to the person represented by the statue. Well, you know, that idea, uh, it was in a lot of religion. In the Shinto religion, they, they lit candles, but the candles were to grandpa or to great grandma or whatever, uh, uh, you know, an ancestor from long ago. And it was a way of calling that person up and giving them uh, uh, respect. Uh, let's see, some of their scriptures, geography. Uh, Kojiki, uh, these were the ancient legends of the formation of the island. They had oracles containing religious ideas. Uh, Shinto religion was practiced only in Japan. Nowhere else did they have Shinto. Uh, a mix of religious and Western influence uh, only 30% of the uh, people uh, continue to hold this to be true. Now this was true before World War II. They saw themselves as a divine country with a divine ruler. The emperor was divine. They had a divine mission to rule the world. And that explains the, the, the suicide bombers that they had in World War uh, II. Uh, Adam bombs, 
uh, convince them otherwise. They would, not, they would not surrender in World War II. The war was over. There's no way they could win the war, but they refused to surrender. They wanted to keep fighting and fighting. And you know, there were casualties. And uh, the United States sent a, you know, a, a plane with an atom bomb and dropped it on the city of Hiroshima to demonstrate the power of the Western allies to them. And the emperor kind of, that opened his eyes. And he realized, whoa, we don't have anything to counter the atom bomb, which you know, in a moment leveled an entire city. And he still refused to surrender. And so the Americans went and dropped a second atom bomb, this time on a city called Nagasaki, and did the same thing, completely annihilated that city. They could have dropped it on Tokyo, but the Americans felt that that would create way too many casualties, you know, unbelievable casualties. After the second bomb was dropped, the Japanese emperor finally realized, okay, if, if, if we continue in the war, they're going to annihilate our entire people and all of our country. And so finally acknowledged that they could not win the war. And so they signed an unconditional surrender. If I had more time, I'd explain to you the difference between a surrender, but when you just, when, you know, when two armies are fighting you know, and one surrenders, well, then they meet and they, condition, they have conditions. Okay, we'll surrender if you do this and you guys will do that and you know, we'll work it out. An unconditional surrender means, yeah, you have, no, you have nothing to say. You surrender, period. And, and the winning side dictates all the terms. Well, that's exactly the type of surrender that Japan made in World War II. Two of the things that they had to do in their surrender. One, they had to give up in their religion the belief that they were destined to rule the world. They had to take that out of their textbooks, out of their religion books. They had to stop teaching that to the children. That was done. And the second thing they had to do was change their flag. On the top here, the top flag that you see, uh, the sun with the rays going out, the rays represented Japanese supremacy all over the world. The rays of Japan covered the entire world and Japan was at the center. After World War II, the flag was simply the red sun representing Japan, but no more, no more rays. And so, uh, that's a little bit about uh, uh, Shinto from uh, uh, Japan. All right, one last thing. We've only got about 10 minutes to go. Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism is one of the three uh, missionary, they call them missionary religions. There are only three great missionary religions. <clears throat> the first is uh, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. And when we say missionary religions, what we mean is it's a religion that tries to win over converts. Like Shinto, <laughs> you, nobody was trying to get you to be, you know, to worship Shinto. You, know, you weren't allowed anyways, they didn't want you. Okay, Taoism, same thing, Confucianism. You know. But uh, Buddhism is a missionary religion. They're trying to get converts, okay? In uh, 1932, <clears throat> at the Buddhist convention in Ceylon, uh, their declaration from the meeting said the following, and I quote, Buddhism is the religion that begins without God and realizes that he is no longer necessary. Imagine, Buddhism is the religion that begins without God and realizes that he is no longer necessary. And so the founder of this uh, religion, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, or the enlightened one, uh, or the Buddha, uh, 563 to 480 BC. Uh, he was a Hindu actually, uh, and he belonged to the uh, Kshatriya caste. Remember the five castes, he belonged to the second level there. Um, uh, in Nepal, India, stories of his life only surfaced 500 years after his death. And so we have uh, mystic accounts of his virgin birth where he declared as a baby, 
that he would reach moksha in his lifetime. If you were here in the last couple of lessons, you remember what moksha is, eh? Moksha or nirvana, you know, the highest state that you can, that you reach, you know, where you're merging you know, with the great Brahma and so on and so forth. Well, he said that uh, uh, as a baby, he would, he would be able to reach moksha in his lifetime. Quite a boast for a little baby. Um, he was a dismayed at the world's suffering as a young man, and he proposed what's called a middle way as the way of salvation. Uh, and the way of salvation he uh, called nirvana. Uh, the difference in his teaching was that one could reach moksha while still alive, like in Jainism. Um, he recruited disciples who continued his teachings and with time gained deified state as his teaching and religion spread. In other words, they made a God out of him after he died and after his teachings spread around the world. Uh, Buddhism's idea of deity and mankind, no idea of a personal supreme being. There's no like one God in Buddhism. There are spirits and gods that exist, but they are all part of the great being. The sum total of everything is in the process of becoming. You like that one? The sum total of everything is in the process of becoming. Man has no soul. He is a collection of interconnected skandras, meaning body, senses, feelings, desires, reason. These are all separate things and, the, and they all come together to, to form a body, a person. And then at death, all of these dissolve and they're reformed into another being. It's like lighting, you know, you have a candle and then you, with this candle, you light that candle. In Buddhism, you live, you know, and I'll explain what the life is like. And then when you die, it's like you light another candle. All the things about you uh, uh, come together in a different format and you're like another, another person. All right, eternity of matter idea. Uh, let's see, uh, idea of salvation. Man's desire to have life and individual conscious life is what, uh, and, and what individual conscious life uh, provides, this is what causes misery. In other words, the search for yourself. Who am I? How can I reach my best potential? Okay, as far as Buddhism is concerned, this is what's causing your life to be miserable. Okay, so freedom from endless, from this endless cycle of desire is called enlightenment. And one who is enlightened is the one who desires nothing. So one ceases to be and becomes not being. By not being, one does not desire. Without desire, there's no misery. And so the whole goal of Buddhism is to eradicate all desire that you may have. And I'm not talking about bad desire, you know, like I, I, I desire to steal or I desire another man's wife or you know, that kind of desire. No, no, any kind of desire. You know, I want to be a better person. Yeah, you got to get rid of that. I want to be a better person. Yeah, no. I want the best for my children. Yeah, that's you want. You got to take want out of your vocabulary and out of your heart and out of your mind. You, you have to get to the point where you don't want anything. You don't even feel you want anything uh, any, anymore. The state, of, the state of nirvana is being within being. In other words, you're not yourself, you're part of the whole. Now there's a system of, dis, uh, of discipline that leads you to this state. One must accept and live by what's called the threefold tr uh, through, uh, truth. Boy, that's hard to say, threefold truth. <laughs> the first is the impermanence of all things. Everything is just temporary. Sorrow is part of all individuality. In other words, the more you want to become an individual, the more sorrow you will have in your life. And man has no soul. Man has no soul in Buddhism. In other words, you have no individuality. You're, there's no you in there. You got to get rid of the you in there if you want to be 
you know, if you want to reach uh, nirvana. Uh, then there are the uh, four, you know, the worship part, uh, the four noble signs. The four noble signs, all existence involves suffering. There's a pleasant thought for you. All suffering is caused by desire. Suffering ceases when desire ceases and desire is destroyed when one follows the eightfold pathway. And, and the eightfold pathway is a series of instructions in right living. In other words, the eighth, eightfold pathway is the way that will lead you to the point where you will not desire anything any longer. You will not be you anymore. Uh, temples and shrines for offerings to Buddha and prayers and teaching. Uh, monks live, Buddhist monks, they live in a community life. A little bit like monks in the Catholic uh, church, different ideas, but a similar lifestyle. Uh, their scriptures, their geography, uh, miscellaneous things. So the uh, Tripictas, uh, written 250 BC uh, are a collection of writings known as the three baskets, discipline, teachings, and metaphysical. The Dhammapada, those are the sayings of Buddha. Um, this religion began in India, but almost uh, became extinct in India and now is practiced worldwide. I mean, some of my numbers say 200 million, but there's way more than 200 million people that practice Buddhism. Uh, in the world. Uh, the Buddha himself uh, is seen in different ways. There's the essential Buddha, the being. There's the Nirvanic Buddha, who is the earthly Buddha in blissful state after death. And then there's the earthly Buddha, his appearance on earth. And you see Buddha you know, lying on the side sometimes, or is up this way, different ways. you know. Uh, and then the idea of Zen Buddhism, uh, that's Japanese uh, Buddhism, uh, and they stress meditation as the way to arrive at this nirvanic, you know, not being type thing. Meditation does that. That's why they, you know, you say, wow, you're really Zen today. Well, you know, that comes from over here. A small personal story. In Montreal, uh, we had a church building there and we sold that building and bought another building. And so our building is up for sale. <clears throat> And our building was an actual church building. It was an old Presbyterian church building that we bought and you know, restored and, and so on and so forth. And we were there for many years. But anyway, so we're selling the building and there's a law, you got to sell it to who buys it. You're not allowed to say, I'm only selling our Church of Christ building to other members of the Church of Christ. It doesn't work. You know? uh, if Catholics want to buy it, you, you've got to sell it. If, if the hell's angels want to buy it, you got to sell it. You know, that's the law. So, so lo and behold, it's on the market for you know, a couple of months. And who buys it? Buddhist monks. They want, they want to start a Buddhist kind of uh, temple there you know, for worship. And so the guy, uh, you know, the Buddhist, uh, I don't remember his name, but anyway, he's a very pleasant man. You know, we, we shook hands, how are you, and this and that. And, and uh, you know, he's looking around and uh, Julia, my family knows, because they remember the layout there. And uh, the main room, the thing about the room is we, it wasn't this big, but you know, maybe half the size of this, this room here, the, which was the main room, uh, it had no columns. You know? there, were no, there were no columns in the middle you know, anywhere. It was all built. Anyways, the way it was built, we had a way large room with no columns. So when, they, when the two Buddhist uh, reps came in and they looked around, they went, oh, this is perfect. And I said, oh, really? You know? And he said, yes. He said, we had many other places that offered us their room and had a good, a good, uh, you know, good deal. Uh, but the problem, there were, there were uh, 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 columns you know, in the way, in the room. And I said, well, what difference does that make? He said, the Buddha cannot see around columns. <laughs> so I said, okay. You know. <laughs> At that moment, I was so glad to, to be a disciple of Jesus. You know? <laughs> So anyways, uh, yeah. Uh, so to summarize, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna note uh, three common things about these religions in comparison to Christianity, which demonstrate Christianity's su uh, superiority. And now, of course, I know online, I'm gonna get all kinds of mail from our dear Buddhist friends that are gonna you know, be upset. So 
just a, a mildly humorous thing uh, is what happened. So here's a couple of things that demonstrates, I believe, uh, the um, superiority of Christianity. And then we're done for tonight and you can start the exciting uh, lock-in. Uh, uh, first thing, you know, I, I, why, why do you think Christianity is superior to these religions? First of all, these religions contain no prophecies. No prophecies. Christianity, we have prophets, you know, 700 years, a thousand years before Jesus, who described perfectly, exactly, in minute detail, who Jesus was, when he would come, what he would do, how he would do it, what would happen, uh, all of it. We have all of it. As a matter of fact, uh, next Sunday or this coming Sunday, the class in here, the auditorium is going to be on the book of Isaiah. If you want to talk about accurate prophecy to, you know, right down to minute detail, you'll see that in the book of Isaiah. None of these religions contain any of that. So I'd rather, go with the, I'd rather go with the book that has something supernatural about it that can be demonstrated and proven. Number two, no resurrected leader. Notice all the leaders of the religions I've said to you, born 470 BC, died, you know what I'm saying? All of the leaders here, they were born and they died. They were born and they died. Our leader resurrected from the dead. Our leader is alive today. He was alive in 1854 for the Christians in 1854 and he was alive for the Christians in 800 AD and in 500 AD he was alive for those Christians and in the year 2020 he's alive for us. We have a living leader, not a dead one. So our religion is superior because our leader is superior to their leader. And they also have no inspired scriptures. Their writings are philosophy, how to do this, you know, what the leader taught on that. We have information here that comes from God. So when I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm doing it as a response to the living God and not a leader that lived and died a thousand years ago. I could go on, believe me, and list the reasons why Christianity is superior. We have a better hope for salvation. I don't want to just merge and be nothing. Christianity says that we will be perfected, conscious, alive, and self-aware when we resurrect from the dead. Wow, I'm going to be me in a new body with no imperfections, able to have a relationship with God with no sin interfering with that relationship with God. That's a good deal. I like that. I like that deal. I'm still me after death. We have a better guide for this life, the Bible. We have a greater result of good in history. What, is, what has Hinduism done for India? Have you been to India? Have you, I'm glad for you. Have you been to India? Have you seen it? Again, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited towards our, our friends from India, but have you gone to India? Have you seen it? Yes, there are beautiful parts of India and the rich people really live well there, but the rest of the people don't live that well. Have you been to countries that, that, that don't have Christianity as their main religion? They live under dictatorships. They have no concept of freedom. Christianity has, has freed men from slavery, it has raised the value of women. The women were treated as furniture, basically chattel in the time of Jesus. No, no better than chattel, they were property. Even if you married your wife, she, was, she belonged to you just like your, you know, whatever your sweater belonged to you. It's through Christian teaching uh, uh, that, the, that women have been raised 
uh, in, you know, to be uh, the value that God has given to women, just like the value he's given to men. Christianity did that, not Buddhism, not Hinduism, not Taoism, none of those religions have done that. And we have a more adaptable religion. We, we, we've brought Christianity to every part of the world. Every part of the world has Christianity. You couldn't bring Shinto here, it wouldn't work. Even Buddhism, I mean, you know, there are Buddhists in this country and a lot of movie stars get into it, but really, you know, Buddhism wouldn't work here. Imagine saying, okay, here's the religion I want you to, to, to get into. I want you to give up being you. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be you anymore. Well, who am I going to be? Am I going to be a better me? No, 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 you're going to be nothing. What? <laughs> you're going to disappear. Oh. Okay, yeah, I don't think people are going to buy into that. But you go to Japan and you say to a Japanese person, you're a sinner and they'll go, yeah, God will save you. And this is what he promises to you. And this is how we know it. And we have churches in Japan and we have churches in Thailand and we have churches in China and so on and so forth. All right, so that's a, a little bit about comparative religions. I, I know I went very quickly, I mean, six lessons to cover 12 major religions, ridiculous really, it's just that, you know, a flyby, it's a flyby. But anyways, it just gives you a little bit of ideas, a little bit of an idea about these different religions.